So I guess for starters, we we'll get to backgrounds. Like, who are you? Mm -hmm. What's your name? Where are you mm -hmm. from? What are you interested in? How'd you mm -hmm. get into? That's a <laughs> long, long story, but uh, yeah, my name is Dylan Smith. I run a video production company that focuses on documentary and corporate work. I try to make my corporate work more like documentary because that's what I feel like is the best, I guess passion and emotion is what I enjoy capturing the most. And I think that's what sells the most, gets the most sales. I think if someone connects on an emotional level with the company, then they want to support them any way they can. Um, I've tried a lot of things. I've, I've, I've tried a lot of different industries. I, I would consider myself a photographer at one point. I mean, I still I'm skilled that way, but um, I definitely was like tr like doing more photography than video at one point um i did youtube did, like while i was working a full-time job before i did video professionally uh and one thing led to another and now and now i'm here that's super cool super super dope um if i were to answer the same questions uh, my name is devon vereen i'm a photographer first um, i dabble a little bit in photography, I have a little bit of a video background. Um, coming up in my years, um, I did a lot of gaffing. Um, I realized the quality, uh, the skill of lighting applied for both video and photography. And it's the thing that um, I was most passionate about doing. Um, originally from the Bronx, New York. Um, so I kind of grew up in Manhattan. Um, one of some of my first jobs were like in high-end retail. So I worked for Bergdorf Goodman. Um, I worked for Victoria's Secret for a little bit of time. And a lot of the inspiration that I had was um, through some of the, like the magazines that came out. So like I used to read a lot of like Harper's Bazaar. I used to read a lot of Vogue and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, my medium, I primarily like working with people. Um, I'm a portrait photographer first. Um, I work more with women, but I don't have a specific preference. Um, I just enjoy sh capturing people's moments. Um, so like, I love doing weddings where it's all glitz and glamour. You have the big dress on, you have this personal moment with your mom and dad, your family. Um, over my time of doing photography, I've come to realize the importance of a photo. Um, the importance of a moment. Um, one image that you may take today uh, might capture and immortalize something that you might not be able to, to see again. Um, so for example, if a family member passes, that, that moment that you captured at a wedding or at a social gathering, you know, you have a point of reference. You can refer back to that photo. So um, for me, um, I got into photography through passion. Um, I enjoyed doing the glamour styled work. And I tried to figure out a way to blend what I'm passionate about with what my purpose is, which is capturing moments for people. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I do. I'm a photographer. I'm a portrait based photographer who works with people. <laughs> do you think that, I guess, like, I don't know how long you did live in New York, but do you think that is a big reason that you're a photographer and you started to work with fashion and Stuff like that. So that's a cool question because um, I, I guess I got two answers for you. So um, not I don't think it's that because I grew up in New York that I like photography because it turns out that um, ever since I was a kid, um, the women before me. So my grandmother took a lot of pictures of me in my youth. My mom took a lot of pictures of me in my youth. Um, my mom herself um, kind of grew up in the industry like she was a singer. She was a dancer. She did clothes. So she's always in front of the camera. And by proxy, I was always with her. So I think for myself, I was exposed to cameras at a young age, like three or, and, and so on. I can remember like my first photo shoot being in a studio at five, at five years old with my mom. Um, and that's like one of my first conscious memories of that, of being in a studio. So I think inceptually by my environment, I kind of fell in love with photography. Um, when I got my hands on my first camera, I just kept going from there. Um, and as I've shot, um, like as I kind of like explained to some of the people that I work with, um, the moment that I enjoy is when you capture a picture of someone and they look back at that photo and they get like, like that moment of shock, like, oh my God, like I look that good. Like, yeah, like this is the light that you look like. Um, I don't think that people usually see themselves in that light until the proper photo is captured. Um, so I don't think that New York per se had influence on whether or not I became a photographer. I think that being in New York gave me more things to shoot. 
um, it gave influence to the kind of work um, because with, you know, New York is a capital for a lot of things. So like music industry, fashion, food, um, I think having that input gave me different things to look at or different interests to focus on or different things to try. Um, but I think I would have always ended up being a photographer. Um, it's interesting you say that because I, I think it, I mean, I think it skipped a generation, but my grandfather was a World War II photographer. Sweet. And um, I really didn't see because of, I guess, his age when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, he passed away at 88 when at age 88 when I, I I might have been eight years older it might be a little I might be a little off there but I didn't really get to know him mm -hmm. that well and I didn't get to really see him as a photographer because he after World War II he got a he had a studio uh, off the of battleground in Greensboro uh, did portraits and then he did framing as well he switched to framing um, like paintings and, and prints and stuff like that um, but I always like even without him and my other grandfather too is a big part of this too because he always took interest in anything I was into. Um, like I would make little movies. I'd, I'd like take his camcorder and make like little little movies with him, like at his house, and, um, whatever I I could at like ten years old, twelve years old. Um, so I think both both my grandfathers I think had a really big I guess inspiration for me. One one was just more just looking back on what he did uh as a photographer and then the other one was more just like helping me with videos and helping me just do whatever i wanted to do and i think that's so important too because even myself i remember um explaining to my mom like hey i want to be a photographer she was kind of like pushing me to become a lawyer which is crazy because i married a lawyer in the long run right dun, 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 or whatever <laughs> anyway um yeah so my i remember when i was becoming more interested um i remember i had a uh, the Canon point and shoot. It was like a can. I can't remember what it was, but it was like this little pink camera. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, I used to like take it to school and take pictures of my friends again because like th they like for whatever reason that was my way of connecting. So if we were doing things like dancing in the hall or singing or just mm -hmm. playing around, I would document that um, those moments or whatnot. And so I would come home and I would explain that to my mom. Like, yeah, I, I think I really like taking pictures. Um, at first, she was like, that's not a viable career. You're not going to be able to make money off of that, you know. Um, but I think uh, her, her, the way she explains the story is one day I might have taken a photo of like a false, like a fake flower in the house. And I lit it a certain way that, to make it look real. And I think from that moment on, when she realized that there was actual talent there, she like doubled down on making sure I got the proper resources to cultivate that skill. So um, just to like double back, um, I think having the support systems are very important mm -hmm. to creatives having people who uh can see the skill set and, and tell you you can do it i mean I, I i myself am a creator i feel like we doubt ourselves often very very frequently um but it takes for the circles around us to kind of like give us the foundation um to believe in ourselves and our art at some point like in the beginning portion at least until you obviously build your confidence and skill set well i think uh even though my dad uh, never pursued photography. He was very. He's he's always been very artistic mm -hmm. in a more physical way. He 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 turned my after I moved out out mm -hmm. of my uh, the house I grew up in. He turned my bedroom into uh, like a like a painting studio. That's cool. And he paints like abstract art. And I'm telling him you should sell this stuff. And yeah, it's good. He just he doesn't think it's that good. But like I remember he would he'd make like he'd take like our mirror and like our in our bathroom and like make like put all these piping around it make look look a steampunk like type thing he just he just do weird stuff like that that was just so cool like he would just take anything he could find and just put it together and make art out of it just around the house um but he always like he always was super supportive of anything i did um i mean there was a point when i was like right towards the end of high school i was just making stupid youtube videos mm -hmm. like with most of my free time with my friends, some of it with my friends, just like reviewing cameras or just throwing stuff around, whatever. It just be, it, it was a lot of stupid stuff. And my dad's like, you gotta get a job, you gotta work. And uh, and I actually ended up working retail too, uh, but it was more out of necessity mm -hmm. because my dad's like, you gotta get a job, you gotta make money. Mm -hmm. Like, and I didn't, I didn't really know the business behind video. Cause I mean, I was doing video at the dish with YouTube and I didn't, wasn't, wasn't getting anywhere with it, with, with how I was doing it. like. 
it just i mean it's just something kind of fun with friends type of thing and um so i got a i got a job and i got a lowe's a lowe's home improvement and it was a cashier um but it was more of just like get a job and and just uh, have it to just make money uh and then i ended up going to photography school and uh i was i just like but i was like okay you're going to photography school now and that and that became so involving i just quit my job at lowe's and then ended up learning the business and learning stuff I could do to actually make money. I think I kind of had a similar uh, induction into like the business side of photography. Um, you know, being it that it was a hobby, I enjoyed taking pictures and whatnot. Um, in New York, being that it's a bigger city, it's kind of easier to make money. It's not like, um, you know, so like a lot of the work that I would do, like I was like 18, fresh out of high school. I found myself doing like little odd jobs, like sneaking into like clubs and lounges and kind of like photographing the crowds. And then those pictures would lead to, um, hey, we have a baby shower here and there. Um, but I always had a job in retail too, because the thing about photography is like, or at least I didn't really understand it then. Um, you have, you always have to have a balance. Like photography makes money sometimes and then sometimes it doesn't. And like in the in between time, you still have to make money. and it's an expensive hobby. Like our cameras are really mm -hmm. expensive. Yeah. Our lenses are really expensive. And so the m deeper I got into it, the more lenses I, I wanted to buy. So for me, um, the way that I, I also balanced it the same way, I didn't go to school for it. I kind of just picked it up and, and ran with it. And um, I developed my style through experience um, and just time in behind the camera. Um, same thing with lighting. Um, I've invested in my equipment and just kept trying, trying. Um, until I, I cultivated my own style or what, whatnot. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that. Um, I got a question. Do you think that um, going to film school uh, made a difference for you? Well, actually, I went to, well, I kind of skipped a step there because uh, essentially I was making YouTube videos while I was working. Uh, I, guess my, I was just, I was still making YouTube videos while I worked at Lowe's. I, I didn't have as much time, but I, I did. And uh, there was a family friend, um, someone my dad knew really well, who we were hanging out with. He owns a business, and um, my dad was like, hey, show me YouTube videos. And I'm like, I don't want to show my YouTube videos, but I ended up showing a couple of my YouTube videos, which just were kind of like vlog, kind of trying to copy, I guess, Casey Neistat at the Casey time. Casey Neistat, that's like yeah. <laughs> It's like 2018, 2017, around that time period. Um, and he, he's like, show me YouTube videos. And I did. And uh, then like three months later, I got a call from this friend of his. And he's like, I need you to film a documentary for me. That's a big job. And I kind of took, and uh, I'm kind of glad that I did this. Mm -hmm. I kind of took what he said because he's an older guy. Um, I kind of took what he said with a grain of salt. Like, oh, he doesn't want a documentary. He just was a YouTube video. So I treated it like a YouTube video. I was like, I'm just going to film, film, film. I'm just going to film what they're doing. And, it, and and his business was an auction company, antique auction company, someone I still work with uh, for several events every every year. Um, but they they had their job was to liquidate, to remove everything from a house that had been in the same family since the, 19, the 1890s. Sweet. And it was like a time capsule. They never threw anything away. That's and it was like a 10,000 square foot house in Reedsville, North Carolina. And I just went there every day I could, like on off days, like from work, from Lowe's, like, and he was like really cool with that too. Like he just wanted, he seemed like he just wanted to support me. He just like, and I even, I didn't know how much I was making from it. He just said like, I need you to, I'm going to pay you at the end when it's done. And I just filmed, 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 filmed them, like taking stuff out. I would, they would like rip, they would take stuff out of newspapers and, and like be able to tell exactly what it is. Cause all of them were antique experts. They knew exactly what most of it was, all these antique rugs and all these antique toys and paintings and all this stuff and i worked i filmed probably for two months just on off days and they would like prior they would like okay we're not going to go in this room until dylan's here like that type of thing because they knew they knew they had an idea of um i guess the category of stuff that was in there like the time period on in each room um but i spent two months filming and then probably two months editing mm -hmm. well like a month of editing then i went and did interviews with all the Engineers and end up making a 15 minute documentary sweet that they paid me a pretty good amount um and I, I took like half that money and bought a better like better camera yeah that's how it goes, <laughs> pretty yeah. pretty good amount and they ended up hi continually hiring me for more of their auctions um but i still have yet to go to a big big property like that it seems like that's a pretty rare for them but um was that the project that made you decide this is what i want to do 
Well, I did a bunch of stuff for them. Like I would film auctions for them like once a month. And I was, I was still going to school at that time. I'm not, I'm not school. I was still going to work. I was still working at that time until, um, I just, I, I realized I really wasn't making a ton of money just filming their auctions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't really know how to pivot. I didn't know how to like take what I was doing for them and say and go to other businesses and say I can do the same thing for you because of the because of what it was. It was highlight videos of auctions of like these of those them selling stuff. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to take those like I mean they're basically YouTube videos, basically like just filming what was going on. I didn't know how to take those type of videos and go go to any other company. And I didn't also didn't like put myself out there with them. I don't know. I just I didn't really know I didn't even have a social media presence really. I might have been posting po photos. Um, like street photography or whatever at the time on Instagram, mm -hmm. but I didn't really know how to like advertise myself. I didn't know, I didn't know any of that. So then I went to photography school and the reason I went to photography school, cause it was a lot cheaper and I could commute from my parents' house, mm -hmm. um, to go to photography school. And with what I learned through photography school and with what I learned, and they also, for that degree, it's an associate's degree in photojournalism that I ended up getting. Um, I had did two internships and I interned with two media companies that I basically for eight weeks, like 40 hours a week, I basically got to see like a media company, just like <laughs> see what they did it, like going to factories and going to all these do all these corporate videos and see how they filmed the interviews. I really got to see everything like yeah. from like in a fly on the wall perspective. And, uh, and then that media company ended up even hiring me occasionally to help them whenever they needed an extra person, even though they, they had a team of people. But I think they just did that to kind of to be nice to me because they, it seemed like they always had interns and they always took advantage of interns. Uh, I don't want to get into that, but, mm -hmm. um, but that's how that's yeah, that's, big companies do, you know, yeah. when they have interns. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's definitely a really, really good way to like get your foot in the door and learn. Um, so look, just, look. just, just quick question. Do you think that the average person can find an internship and that'd be easier or was the process of going to school? Um, did that? I think with the media company that I went through, because they always, I was the first student from the school I went to, to okay. be an intern at that media company. They had had a lot of, like a lot of students, like a lot of film students, like people who are going to film school, for, like at Elon or something mm -hmm. like that. A lot of them were, but I was the first person. And the only reason I found out about them is because they did a video for my college, for the school I went to. They did one for the photography program I was in. So I was like, who are those guys who were there? I need to get their contact. I need to meet them. Absolutely. Because they like literally filmed me in the classroom. Like I was like, and they had like an FX6 and like really fancy equipment. And I was just like, I need to know them. And um so and they were they were really cool guys um working with them and uh seeing how they worked i got to see them edit got to see them work and it was really cool so uh just just to kind of like connect um on, on my process mm -hmm. so i didn't do i didn't go the school route mm -hmm. um, i kind of just picked up a camera and ran with it but i realized one of the important skills was experience mm -hmm. and the only way to get that experience was through internships now i in my later age understand the importance and the values of the internships that i didn't understand then but being again in a bigger city like New York, you kind of just get snatched up. Like if you're in the right place at the right time and you have the right look, uh, attitude and, um, and and willingness to work with people, they'll just, you know, you, you can find opportunity. Um, so for me, um, while I did not go the internship route, I did have the opportunity to do certain things like um, one of the bigger projects that made me realize like how far photography could potentially take me. Um, I had the opportunity to work for the McDonald's Ronald House, Ronald McDonald House wow. Foundation. Um, and simply because I had went to one of the um, protests that were going was going down in New York, um, I had my camera out and one of the guys there was like, hey, yo, you shoot? I'm like, yeah. He's like, yo, I got this opportunity that's happening like on Saturday. Could you be available? Yeah, absolutely. He's like, what's your rate? I gave him my rate at the time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that opportunity was. Mm -hmm. He was like, yeah, we're shooting for McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Thought it was like a joke mm -hmm. until I got there. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so now I'm in this room surrounded mm -hmm. by billionaires photographing this like super big situation. Mm -hmm. um, and it was inspiring. Like um, I was surrounded, like I remember uh, within the group, um, I was a photographer and we had like four models with us. So when we get to the Ronald McDonald House Foundation, um, it, I think it was like a country club. We had like our own uh, personal room. It was like oysters, champagne and all kinds of cool stuff mm -hmm. that got sent to us or whatever. Um, and granted that was just like the side portion of it. Mm -hmm. the, 
main portion was the work, just documenting the fundraiser that they were having at that time. Um, so me, here I am, this 18 year old kid with a camera just in this big space. I was like, holy, mm -hmm. like, I didn't know that documentation uh, could open the doors for me in that way. Um, and so um, while I didn't go the internship route, I went the experience route. Mm -hmm. um, that one job opened the door for like several other jobs. I found myself uh, documenting events for like inner city um, wow. nonprofit organizations and it's just word of mouth and building the network. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, that's how I kind of got into it um, and have been able to keep pushing it going forward is just building the networks and, and being in the right rooms with the right people and just being associated with the opportunity. Um, do I wish I would have went to school for it? Yes. I feel like I probably could have learned a lot faster um, these things or like had mentors to explain uh, the importance of internships, the importance of networking. I kind of just fumbled forward mm -hmm. until I got the sauce together, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, yeah, I think, I think to answer your question before, because I didn't really answer it that well, I think that I really didn't have, I mean, even when I was still doing, when I was doing stuff for that auction company and I didn't really know where to go, I didn't really have the confidence to just go out and mm -hmm. like, it's like I did street photography with like friends and stuff, but I didn't really have the confidence to like go to an event and just shoot like without, like I thought, oh, I need from, like, I just didn't think I could just shoot people, like shoot photos of people, mm -hmm. um, like just willy nilly without asking them or anything like that. But then, um, like just to get candid photos or whatever at people partying, mm -hmm. um, and I guess going to photography school, they basically would just give me assignments like, hey, go shoot an event, go mm -hmm. go shoot an event and get interviews. And through me doing that, I would like approach, I would go to like events and I would like go up to a DJ and be like, hey, can I film your event? And they would like let me in for free. Yeah. And I think that's when I started to see like, yeah. oh, there's this power here, even though like, I'm just getting started out. Like, it's like, uh, it's like, oh, they're, they're giving me a free ticket to go shoot their event, mm -hmm. interview them, and I'm making video for them. And then those, and then like I would almost I would turn my school projects mm -hmm. because I don't know what told me to do this, but I would send my school projects. I would like do, like, I'd get assigned a video, like to do an event video, go film a DJ that I just heard about, then I'd interview that DJ for the like as a part of the video, make like a little one minute highlight video, mm -hmm. and then I would get critiqued on it, get graded on the video, fix it fix all the, everything that the teacher said was wrong with it. Then I would send it to every single person that was in the video that I could find, like that's, on Instagram. And I didn't, I don't know who told me to do that. I don't, I don't. I that's great marketing. Brand, yeah, I, I literally just sent it to every single person who was in the video, including like the DJs. I mean, obviously I sent it to DJs. And then I ended, and then uh, the DJs ended up hiring me, not to make highlight videos, but just to film raw video of like their events uh, for them to edit. And they would just continually hire me to, to make, just to film like them at different venues uh and then other DJ and then i mean i was uh, i mean there's like three or four djs that, like dj groups that were hiring me at one point um and I, I, then that was also uh, there was also other events like other just random events that i would like music events or like um events that, like music it was i mean a lot of them were focused around music um like music at a bar or music at a dirt certain place and in that certain place would like there was there was some kind of hemp place that had some like blues jam session I did a video for and it was just anything I could really find but that like got my foot in the door to some of these places that would then hire me again. Like I would do a school project and then they would hire me again to um actually get paid for it. I mean it wasn't a ton of money because I didn't really know how to charge how much to charge. That's another thing I feel like living here in North Carolina, maybe compared to living in New York, it's like I really wasn't exposed to people who were charging, I guess, normal rates for video, which is really why I went under sort of an under understanding of that in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, pricing is very weird, um, especially um, there's a, com a common conversation that I'm having with my peers here um, is that like the market, do you believe that the market dictates the price or do you believe that the uh, creative dictates the price? I think, I mean, I, I think that, um, I think there's, I mean, people can charge whatever they want to charge. It doesn't really have to be, but I think there's sort of a standard, um, I guess there's a standard. I mean, some, like, it really is just how much you value your time, really. I mean, I know people who have day rates of 300 and know people who have day rates of 1500 
And you might be like, what's the difference between those two people? I mean, it's really just how you value yourself. And people who have like 10 years worth of experience versus people who have three years worth of experience. Like there's a huge difference between those two people. And you might look at both their work and they might look the same, but it's like, or they might not look the same. I don't, I don't know. Like some people just value themselves differently. Yeah. But I think that people who value themselves super, super high are going to look down upon those who who look who who value themselves super super low. Yeah. They're like, oh, you're ruining the market. But then, also, there's the the. I mean, there, there's different ways to look at it because it's like the people who are who are paying for, um, someone who who values themselves less. Can't ne probably can't afford people who charge themselves super super high. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know. It, there's, there's different ways of looking at. It. There's people who have different philosophies when it comes to pricing. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, when someone, if someone were to hire me and I've told this b before to people, if someone like hires me to just help them like film with my own cameras, like I bring my equipment with me, mm -hmm. um, I tell them, I tell them my day rate is this and, and they're like, cool. And like, I, I could tell them just based on the reaction, if they are familiar with that. I mean, there's, there's whole groups out there that, I mean, there's. I still I feel like there's like a traditional way of doing everything where it's like you got a grip, you got a gaff, or you got all this other stuff with video, you got a PA, mm -hmm. and then there's kind of this newer sort of like oh we because of the technology we have and autofocus and all this other stuff, mm -hmm. um, it's like you can get away with working on a two person crew, working on a three person crew, especially if um, the client can't afford like a ten thousand dollar job. Mm -hmm. Um, which I, I've been on those sets before and those are here. I, I'm honestly think it's, it's the industry. It's whatever. It, it, I think it's based on the, the, like to a degree. I mean, it, like I said, it, I think it varies, but I think it's kind of based on the industry you're, you're the, the, the industry you're working in. So it's right. like, if, if you're working in like a manufacturer, a manufacturing company that's manufacturing goods for all over the country, it's like, they're going to want a more higher end product. Like a more higher end video, they're gonna want a team. Like they're gonna expect a team of like five plus, right? Versus just a guy soloing it with a gimbal, like right, 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 right. right. So, yeah, or like, it, I mean, I can't. I, I personally, I can't imagine doing like ten interviews with somebody all by myself for like, like it, for a, like again a manufacturing company. And like it's, I mean. Yeah, I mean that's just the perspective I could see from, and I could definitely see where people agree, disagree with that. But um, I've heard I've heard both sides of the sides of some different creatives on that, like pricing cheap versus pricing expensive. But right. I will say that like you price cheap, then you got to work so many more jobs, so many more small jobs versus trying to get these big jobs with more higher end companies. Right. So this is a, a conversation. And it doesn't really apply. Sorry, it doesn't really apply to photography. I know that. No, no, but, but it does, though, because at the end of the day, um, the conversation we're really having is a, as as business owners. Right. Um, at the end of the day, you still have to pay the bills. You got to pay your overhead. So you have to find a recipe for payment. <laughs> um, and whether you value yourself cheaply, like there's a difference between being, I don't know, like a McDonald's or like a Gordon Ramsay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's the same conversation. Um, whether you're selling your burgers for, I don't know, three dollars or selling your burgers for 50 bucks, um, it becomes the quality of the product. And um, I think the conversation becomes more about the quality of the product and who you're servicing, who your audience is um, and and yeah, and who wants to purchase that product. Um, I have this conversation very, very often with a good friend of mine. Um, he um, he's one of the people, one of those people who um, values himself, himself highly. Um, and he invests in his skill, his equipment, his knowledge constantly. So he's one of those people who refuses to take a project that's like less than a thousand. Mm -hmm. And that's me underbidding. His price is way higher than that. Um, and myself as a photographer, I've always thought like, does it, wouldn't it make sense to give the people a discount? Like, um, you know, like, wouldn't it be better to be cheaper and to make it affordable so people book you? But as i've grown as a business as 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 i've grown as an entrepreneur i've come to understand the other side it's like like you said why would i spend time shooting a hundred different projects for a minimal price when i can just wait for the bigger client um so my question is always how do you make money in between that time frame and so his response is always you're an entrepreneur figure it out right mm -hmm. and so that's very vague but what we usually break it down and uh, break that down to is if my price is my price and you can't afford my price, you can't afford me. 
if I myself need to make a living, I will find other ways to do that by utilizing other skills or other resources um, to bring in that dollar um, to take care of you know my main overheads. So the same person, while he's a phenomenal director, um, he wears a lot of hats. While he's a phenomenal director, he's a f phenomenal DP. He knows a lot about gaffing. He knows a lot about production. He um, is a great editor. Um, whenever he can't get the budgets in the way that he's he, he would like, he'll double down on one of the other skills in order to to, to bring in the money. Um, and so I'm just kind of like telling that story for any young uh, creatives that may be watching um, and who may be like excited to get into this industry in this field. Um, at the end of the day, you have to have a, a strong business sense and understand how to pivot. Either A, you can go the cheap route and sell your service for really cheap, but you'll be doing a lot more work um, or B, you can value yourself and, and price and market yourself at a fair value rate um, that will allow you to do your job efficiently and effectively um, to get the bigger clients. I think at the end of the day, the bigger clients rather pay for what they need. Mm -hmm. The cheaper clients are going to pay for what they can get and complain about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at least that's what I've experienced in my time. Um, so, yeah, you have any advice to, to any young creatives that might be starting off or, you know, I mean, I definitely think that the idea of of doing a, a project, just one one like showing essentially just showing a company what you can do, yeah. doing one project for free, like one video, one photo shoot, whatever it is, show them what you could do. Just say, hey, hey, like either however you want to spin it, you could say, oh, I'm running a sale, or you could say, I'm just getting started. However you want to run it, um, or, or or like however you just want to get your like it's a really really good way to get your foot in the door and then like the, the the idea is the next one it the next thing is and they, they really love it oh we really love what you did how about you come back to this next event and we'll pay you this or you say how much do you charge yeah i charge this like however that conversation goes but it's like you get your foot in the door you show them what you can do mm -hmm. and i think that's and then a lot of some people are going to disagree with that like oh you should never work for free but it's like no you have to <laughs> yeah and I, I just wanted to chime in because i know yeah. you're gonna keep going but as a creative, I think the goal is you have to find the way to do the free work in order to build your portfolio. So if you're doing that free work, it has to be at quality so that it, it it's able to be used to market to other people who might be interested in your work. Don't do free work for your aunties, cousins, nieces, and nephews where the, it, the product doesn't have any value. Do free work for those who can get you further into the door of whatever industry you're pursuing, you know? Um, and that's just my two cents on it. Like if you're working to build your portfolio, that's okay. Um, but if you're doing it just because someone asked you to, I think you should evaluate. Mm -hmm. um, I think you should evaluate the importance of, of the project. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Well, I, I'd say like, like, and also when you're looking for people or you, you want to work, let's like you, you want to make commercials for restaurants like it's like don't go to your like the don't go to like your uncle's restaurant that's like a, i mean i mean don't go to like don't go to some mom and pop small little restaurant it's mm -hmm. like if you want to work for like high, a high-end restaurant go to a high-end restaurant go to like a steakhouse like mm -hmm. what that and just say hey i'm just getting started or hey i'm running a sale I would love to work with you guys or hey i want to show you guys what i can do mm -hmm. and like don't make an excuse like in in like be like essentially go do something lesser when you could like go to five steakhouses or how many you have to go to before one says yes to that point i also have come to learn that this is a numbers game everyone's not going to say yes one person will so you have to knock on as many doors as you possibly can it might not be the fifth person it might be the 20th <laughs> that might act, act, actually give you the opportunity to try um but at the end of the day after you do uh, a good job with that 20th person, that number starts to get uh, lower and lower, right? So by the time you have, say, 10 solid projects, when you work, walk into the doors and you go, hey, this is my um, this is my portfolio, this is the work that I do, I would love to work for you, this is what I can do, those no's slowly start turning into yeses. And depending on like your networking skills, you start to develop referrals. As you mentioned, you started in, in, in college or in school um, and taking the opportunity to document one DJ turned into you working for multiple. Um, that one project was able to carry you through. Um, and so for young creatives, I think that's really important. Um, I think you should, guys should, um, 
leverage your work and work for um, high end if you can, you know. Um, yeah. I've also heard, I've also heard people like I've heard a photographer told me this once. Yeah. It's, it's like a certain high, a certain paying client will attract more of that type of paying client. Absolutely. It seems like, I mean, this is, this might not always be true, but it seems like people who are like in, in the same type of business or friends with other people in the same type of business or they're, they or their friends, their friends make closer to the same amount of money as they do absolutely and I, like i said that might not be true everywhere but that's that's what i've noticed it's like if you if you do accept a client that maybe like lowballs you and you do accept them mm -hmm. then they're gonna attract more people like them and i and i agree there's one rule that uh me and my friend we go by um it's um whatever work you do is what you'll be booked for right um because essentially if you're shooting low ball stuff, they're gonna they're gonna go show off, right? Because at the end of the day, our products are great. It's not like we do bad work um, as as individuals. If you do a great job, people are gonna want to refer you. If you did a good job for low ball, they're gonna tell the people in their communities, "Yo, I got these great photos from this this photographer," or "Hey, I got this great video from this this director. You should go hit him up." The best way to mitigate that is to just go straight to the to your target client in the first place. That way when they're referring you it's in those spaces that you need it to be um and uh, yeah so that 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 i can double uh, double down and say i've experienced the same thing um be very aware of your market be aware of your target audience and who you want to bring in toward bring be aware of the people you want to work with and intentionally curate your uh work for that audience so when they get the work done and they refer you you're making money you're in the money um yeah man um you have any questions for me i mean what's um what's the most different what's the most difference like how what's the most different with living in new york versus living here opportunity um and one thing that i've noticed um about new york city and living in north carolina is that um there, New York has a lot of people and there's a lot of industries and then there's a lot of small industries, right? So like, let's just say restaurants. I'm going to just say a number. There's like, <laughs> I wanted to just, there's like a million restaurants in, in New York City. I don't know if that's the actual number, but um, the opportunity is greater because of the amount of restaurants. If you don't get it with this guy, you just go to the next door. You, you literally can walk down one block and talk, and, and go into several different restaurants. And, and it, depending on your, your level of networking, your level of, of communication, you, you're bound to get an opportunity. Um, so when it comes to the work um, that we do, um, it's easier to do it in New York because there's a lot of opportunity, but the it's more so about your hustle because unfortunately in New York, Everyone's a content creator. Everyone's a director. Everyone shoots music videos. Um, if I come to you and say, hey, I got this opportunity, more than likely they'll say, oh, I got a cousin who does it. And that's where your portfolio stands out, right? Um, but it's easier to get into things because of how fast things work in New York. There's always a project that needs to be documented. There's always a, a parade or something. There is always, I don't know, like a CEO of some business who needs work. There's always... Um, there's always a new solo entrepreneur that needs documentation in some way, shape, or form. Um, and at that point, I, the word I want to use is popularity, but I don't think that's the word. That's the one I've been using. But I think it's as however well networked you are, you can uh, build a effective and efficient business. Um, and that's one thing I could say. So me and my good friend, I think it took us all of like three years to become. So what we got. <laughs> okay, so this is how fast it happened. I remember we graduated high school. We both got, he got a T3I. I got a, he got a T3. I got a T3I, the Canon Rebel. Um, within like six months, we were able to upgrade the T3I to the 7D. And I know I'm aging myself because these cameras, like they were brand new at that time. So we were able to upgrade from a T3I to a 7D in like a matter of like two to three months. And then from there, we were able to upgrade from the 7D to the A7 II. It was like when Sony had first dropped the cinema line of, 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 of the A7s or whatever. And then from there, we upgraded from there to a red, you know, and mm -hmm. 
um, at that time I had relocated to North Carolina and I wish I would have stayed there. I don't wish because life is weird. Like a lot of things <laughs> happened for me here in North Carolina. It just didn't particularly happen within the media space, right? Mm -hmm. um, once we got the ball rolling and once we kind of got ourselves in the network of people, of, like once we became known as the movers and shakers, once we became known as the people who do directors, like we shot one music video that kind of went super viral within the um, Hispanic community. And once that blew up, it was like, oh, we got to book this guy. We got to book this guy. And so in New York City, where there are a lot of different types of individuals, it's kind of like once you kind of solidify yourself as that person, people start to come to you. Um, and it's easier to do that there than it is to do it here. I don't know. I feel like this is a personal opinion. Is it more competitive to do it here in North Carolina? Because... I don't know how to answer, ask that question. Like, mm -hmm. how do you become how do you become well known as that guy? Right in New York, you become known as that guy. Mm -hmm. Then you start getting paid. Mm -hmm. you, it's I've, I've in my opinion, it, it's a little bit difficult. It's more competition here in North Carolina. Um, I don't know the question. I think there's there's definitely less people doing it here, and there's also uh, so is, so my question is: Is the value the same? Because there are less people doing the video. Is it valued by the restaurants? Is it valued by the industries? Do people value video here? I, I definitely think people value video here and they value photos here. I think there's, there's, there might be, there's, de there's probably less opportunity. There's probably less videographers and photographers. Well, may maybe, but I don't know about photographers, a lot yeah. of photographers. Um, but also the overall, and I know you could probably find things to debate this yeah. overall the cost of living is a lot higher in new york oh absolutely so that's I, a whole nother story <laughs> yeah but I, I i think i think in my mind someone who who never been to new york yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone who's never been to new york and i want to but haven't yet it's worth um, it you gotta try it we all new yorkers <laughs> would talk crap about how terrible new york is but i really want to if you don't experience new york you won't understand it's a very very love-hate relationship because um yes it is overpriced mm -hmm. but if you live there for long enough you figure out a way to make the money you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like you can literally your rent can be four thousand dollars a month and that's just it. Like you're stuck with that. Mm -hmm. But you can do a project for ten thousand dollars on Monday. Mm -hmm. You can do a project for fifteen on Tuesday, mm -hmm. and then on Wednesday you might get a low ball and a thousand dollar project. Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The opportunity is there, and and that's why I basically say it's based on your hustle. It's based on your network. It's based on who you know and what people you know mm -hmm. for you to make that kind of money. Because I've seen that kind of money mm -hmm. on a random Saturday. Yo, bro, what you doing? Let's go. Let's go do it. We're shooting today. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. And it's like a big budgeted project. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the opportunity is less here. The amount of people who are videographers and photographers are less here. The cost of living is less here. And in my mind, it kind of balances it out. It's like, yeah. it's kind of all, it's, it's, it's kind of the same. I mean, it might not be, yeah. the numbers might not be exactly the same, but in my mind they are. And I definitely think that if you niche down and when I say niche down, you like, you do portraits or you do weddings or you do construction videos or you do videos for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Like if you niche down and you don't necessarily have to, mm -hmm. but I think those who like niche down to construction or niche down to manufacturing or like, it's kind of like you become a, and I'm not, I don't, I haven't niched down yet. I, will, I would like to, I'd like to find that one thing, but I haven't yet. Um, I think you become a specialist yes. in that one well, industry, you figure like you become like the guy who films that type of video, mm -hmm. um, and then I've, I've I've seen because of that people even like get hired to go to Virginia, they get hired to go to Tennessee, they get hired to go to other states to travel because they're the construction guy or the they're the this guy, um, or the this girl, mm -hmm. um. And they become a specialist and then they're like they're looked upon as like oh why would i hire anybody else for that industry to right. film that one industry or I take photos right. that one industry i think you're right one thing about moving from new york so i i think that's the reason why i'm multi-talented is because in the city like it's like it's a hustle if you can do this job we will pay you to do this job and so i had the opportunity to be well-rounded because i did that many things but moving to north carolina it wasn't the same like um 
again in the city, one of my ma major focuses of was photographing like bottle girls because by proxy of being in in the um, clubs and shooting like event photography at uh, with the DJs and things like that, those are the kind of women that were like, "Hey, you're a photographer? You know, let's let, let's shoot with you. Let's shoot with this guy." Um, when I moved to North Carolina, I realized the value of club photography wasn't the same. Like mm -hmm. people, like in New York, everyone thinks they're a celebrity. In North Carolina, they don't value that kind of lifestyle. They mm -hmm. value families. So I had to I had to pivot. I had to go from being in clubs to, okay, let me interact with these families. Like, hey, mom, I noticed you. You know, you you ha you have a baby on the way. Do you mind if I document I document this special occasion for you? I had to realize, like, hey, um, you know, you're you're the father. This is your family. Um, hey, come, let me shoot uh, portraits for you. And I think you're right. Having to niche down and change my target audience is something that I had to do in order to be profitable here in North Carolina. Um, and you know, I'm still in a pivoting right now, trying mm -hmm. to figure it out. But I think that is the sauce. You're right, 100%. Niching down to a focused target group and giving them that target group value mm -hmm. um, definitely makes you a specialist and a sought after uh, entrepreneur. I definitely think there's there's definitely strategy to to it. It's like it's like maybe in New York, if you if you just maybe maybe you're out and about and you're you're maybe like you maybe you could stage something where you go out with your friend and you act like you're shooting a music video and the right per and the right musician sees that mm -hmm. and they're like, I want to shoot a music video and then it's like a five K, ten K, fifteen K music video. Mm -hmm. But it's like here, if you do the exact same thing, you might have someone come up to you and like, Oh, you shoot music videos and then they're barely able to pay four hundred dollars for a music video. But I can just just and, and I apologize for cutting you off. You're one hundred percent correct. That's how it happens in New York City. But the scale is is also like that too. Like mm -hmm. just because they see you outside doesn't mean that that person is of value, right? They can uh -huh. come to you and be like, "Hey, I got two hundred bucks. You want to shoot a video for me?" Okay. And then they're like, "Yo, I just want to stand in front of my building." Like, bro, mm -hmm. no, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. You know. But it's hit or miss. It just mm -hmm. depends on where you are um, to attract the certain mm -hmm. client. Mm -hmm. However, once you do have those higher end quality videos you can then pitch it like you know new york is a hub like mm -hmm. everyone's there mm -hmm. you know you can go to bet you can go to mtv you can go to um you know revolt because mm -hmm. uh you know uh, diddy's there like yeah you can find the people and then you just have to do the marketing mm -hmm. and also by proxy because everyone's a celebrity mm -hmm. you know you'll bump into those uh artists who have a little bit of money in there mm -hmm. they're willing to invest in you but mm -hmm. you will also get the other end and it's about um like we how we started off earlier in this conversation is about valuing yourself mm -hmm. and standing your ground um, but the likeliness of finding that higher yeah. client is, is higher there. Um, well, what I was going to say is, is, uh, it's good. Uh, it's all good. Um, I was going to say is the way to get those people to, to potentially find musicians that might pay more. And it's definitely a lot harder here is to go to recording studios and go to record labels. Yeah. If you can find them, there's not, there might be one or two that I know of here in Greensboro. But if you it, 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 I mean, it honestly applies to anywhere, if you, so. anywhere you live, if it's a smaller city, you go to the recording studios and you and people and the people at those recording studios are willing to pay for a recording studio. So you get at least get like a little bit of a higher sort of bar there versus someone who's like, I, I make music in my bedroom or mm -hmm. and I'm not discrediting that there's 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 really talented people who make music in their bedroom still. Um, I think at the end of it is about the hustle and the value because like we look at uh, artists like uh, I'll just say J. Cole, right? He's he's originally from Fayetteville. He decided, hey, I want to be a recording artist. I'm going to New York for a short duration of time and I'm going to hustle until I make it. And he made it. He's one of the one of the biggest uh, musicians in, in the rap hip hop industry. Um, and I, it, there's, there's no difference. I think the only difference between J. Cole and anybody else is he decided he wanted the hustle. Um, and he went to the to New York and, and he made that network. He reached out to the people. He did what he had to do. Um, and I think that is just something you have to do in any market, any any place. That's one thing. Um, I had a conversation with another uh, photographer today. And oh. that's essentially what he was. Okay. Let me battery. See that, let me see what that is. Probably the battery of a monitor. Um, just in short, um, basically, he mentioned... Um, being aware of, of your market, just being being aware of the market that you're operating in and being willing to move to bigger, better markets or, or you know, lesser markets, right? So if we're based here in North Carolina, being willing to travel to New York for a couple of weeks or travel to LA, Miami, you travel to the market that, 
will um, service you best, you know, and what you do. So, you know, man. Sorry. Uh, so Dylan stepped out. Uh, our uh, battery ran dead on the um, the monitor that we have here. So he's switching out batteries. Um, thank you guys for uh, tuning in and checking us out. Um, we would love to do these a little bit more often, a little bit more frequently. It's a great conversation. Yeah. Um, I mean, I want to do, I want to do more things like this, like just interview people. I think just having good conversations with people, getting to know more people. Yeah. Uh, everyone has different backgrounds. Everyone has different experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, is there any like crazy photo shoot or crazy music video or crazy, like, super crazy or super weird or super uh, unpredictable, whatever Man, you I've, think of? I've had a few different experiences. None that like, I feel like as a creative, being a part of it was super cool, but I've had a lot of, lot of uh, a few different experiences. I know, um, again, my guy, he's, he's great. Um, I, he would pretty much essentially hire me as a guy for I'd come in doing lighting for him. So uh, one of the experiences in which I had, um, we had a good friend who was a producer in New York City. He had a studio in Yonkers. Um, he, we, we rented it out one day and we uh, did a video for this, this, this music artist or whatever. And this was like the first time, it was one of our bigger projects. Um, I, it was the first time I was able to gaff it and light it like the way I wanted to. And we did like a bunch of different lighting. Um, why this was important to me at that time was, um, it was the first time that we produced a project that was like, could have been on MTV or whatever. Um, we had like professional dancers. There was like a dance segment in the video. Um, we had, um, him himself, the artist, he did a little bit of dancing too. Um, I'm not really explaining too much, but it was cool. It was a, it was a super cool experience, um, to be a part of that. Um, cause I didn't at that time. I didn't know that we were capable, you know, mm -hmm. it was like the first big project that we did that made me feel like, oh, wow, like we can really do this. We can really get our work somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. There's one uh, short film that we shot and, and I apologize for, you know, uh, but we had a nude model um, and she was so comfortable being nude that she ended up just walking around the house super nude. And that was weird because like we're it's like she's in the house with a bunch of guys. We're all looking at each other like, dude, put some clothes on. Um, but she was like, no, I'm okay. <laughs> Can I get a snack from the fridge? And we're like, okay. And like that was super, that was super uh -huh. weird. Um, because that was a situation where again, like the power of the camera, like for her to be comfortable around in this, this weird environment that we created. And not to say that's a bad thing, um, because that's what we aspire to do, but it let me know that you can create a space for someone to be comfortable like that in a unique environment. Um, so yeah, that music video we did for Dante, um, that, that short film that we shot for the girl when the girl was walking around nude and that was super weird because that was like, whoa, she's not comfortable doing this. Um, what about yourself? Have you been, have you done anything? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, this goes completely against what we said earlier, but I do think, um, about, about how I guess a certain amount of a certain budget client will attract more of the same budget client this completely goes against this. this is more of an anomaly and this just kind of goes to show that like if you keep networking you keep meeting new people uh you'll you'll ha you'll find opportunities uh and one of the djs that i was filming for who was not paying me a lot uh she was part of a, a dj group she wasn't even she, she wasn't even paying me herself mm -hmm. she also became a social media manager for a private jet company Okay. And yeah, I've told you, I've told you a little bit about this before, but a, a private jet company here in Greensboro. And because she was a social media manager, she would go on all these trips with them, um, filming a lot of stuff with her phone, um, making little social media videos. And uh, because she knew who I was, because I would film her DJing, which I guess at that time was more of a hobby for her. Mm -hmm. um, it's gotten a little bigger for her, so I'm happy for her. Um, and she um essentially like because i was the video only videographer she knew she basically just called me up and said hey we need a videographer we need someone to go with us to cleveland i've never been to cleveland i've never been to, um honestly cleveland's well actually i have been to new orleans but i uh, um cleveland's one of the one of the more bigger cities i've been to um and they flew me on a private jet there that's sweet that is a crazy experience i got to cleveland in one hour without any 
without and i got to bring a big duffel bag more than more than you carry on a plane you like private jet dude I, I have yet to be on a private jet still <laughs> i mean i mean that's, i didn't i didn't want to, like i didn't try to be on a private jet it's not it wasn't my it was i'm sure if someone really like like targeted private jet companies they probably could find one that was i don't know one one would you could free i don't that might be something big but it's like not even something i tried to do um and i was literally with them is this the the video the the lighting so to be able to light something like uh -huh. this was super cool uh -huh. um, we enjoyed i enjoyed being able to gaff that you know um, yeah, and yeah this was the first time that i was able to use like all the multi the different lightings and stuff mm -hmm. like that so this was like this was like where they would literally stop everything to like light stuff yeah like so it was like definitely like a eight plus hour day mm -hmm. um and yeah so this is in the studio that's like obviously mm -hmm. a wall or whatever mm -hmm. on the other side we have all the plants and things like that mm -hmm. we bought everything from home depot like we built the set from scratch this mm -hmm. was like the very first time mm -hmm. she's like a big dancer she dances mm -hmm. like beyonce drake wow. and like a lot of uh artists and things like that mm -hmm. i guess my my experience like if, if i saw this if it's on post to this and they said it was in greensboro mm-hmm but well, there's no reason why it can't be no i'm, I'm what i'm what i'm saying is if i saw this without any context mm -hmm unfortunately mm -hmm. i would think that someone sp spent four hours in, in a, at a club without without like like, oh yeah like, oh, I'm, I'm saying like four hours of the club and the club just happened to have good lights that, that, that's that's where my mind would go nah dude if i showed you the studio <laughs> it, we transformed this whole thing yeah right so like in the back those aquino flow light bulbs mm -hmm. we uh wrapped it in gels mm -hmm. um i think i was shooting with a, a sky panel mm -hmm. um we had obviously a i mean stuff like that i see and, I, and i'm like okay the, like with how bright it is a bit of, but like especially if you told me this was made like several years ago Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's because what nowadays like, like 2016, 2016. I'm saying nowadays with like how how bright like ISO can go and, and where it looks noisy, it's like you could get a similar type of look mm -hmm. with lights that are not as bright because Absolutely. you can go like crazy high into the ISO and it'd be clean. Unfortunately, <laughs> this is back before LEDs were everywhere, right? <laughs> so like again, I would say yeah. that this video we might have shot uh, obviously the um, uh, yeah. ch -ch -ch it five years ago right yeah. so this is yeah. before amarans this is before um you know the the led lights and everything so yeah because like even those light bulbs we had to rig them like literally mm -hmm. i remember mm -hmm. getting shocked and electrocuted mm -hmm. while putting that together mm -hmm. jesus uh, anyway um yeah i just wanted to uh -huh. show that you know, no it just gives good, good, good that out. it gives good context um yeah yeah so what i was saying is i spent a whole weekend in cleveland and i like, met like it, it, the, the event, it was like the private jet company was sponsoring one of Kenny the Jet Smith's champagne lounges, like a private event. Right. And like the bottom of this hotel, the hotel, the, it was like a five five star hotel. Never seen a hotel like this before. Sweet. It was it was like it was like it looked like a mall inside, like had like a post office in the in the hotel. Mm -hmm. Super super weird, but it was like in the basement of there, and it's like I'm just I'm just here with my little tiny tiny little camera mm -hmm. like didn't have any fancy cinema camera like i have now i, I remember that duffel bag i brought was full of these cheap great video maker like amazon brand uh light panels didn't use any of it mm -hmm. i just had it <laughs> i didn't like, i didn't have time i didn't have time to say i didn't didn't spend time at all like i said i didn't have time i just didn't didn't really think it was necessary you know i brought all that stuff like big heavy duffel bag full of lights and light stands and and i just want to chime in on that i feel like as creatives we feel like we need to invest in the equipment like equip you do need to invest in your equipment but you need to invest in the equipment that you need not that you mm -hmm. want not that you think will make you look good what's going to help you make the best product so in hindsight you probably didn't need everything you brought but i mm -hmm. guess at the during that trip and during that process, you realize what is necessary versus what is, you know, what, yeah, yeah, what you wanted to bring versus, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I just, it was just a really crazy experience. Like, I, I even, yeah, even outside of just because that event was the main thing I was filming. Like, and there's a lot of, a lot of mistakes I made going through it. Mm -hmm. Um, like, just i didn't i didn't i didn't really ask them like beforehand like well, what do you guys want i kind of just filmed and like said oh i could make like eight reels for you afterwards and then they said oh we just one but like i filmed all these interviews what do you need them for so there was like a lot of there was a lot of communication there that i could have definitely but you learned yeah and that's the best learn that and it was just a super super crazy experience i mean everything everything was paid for hotel was paid for it was during the all-star game like 
Um, so we got to experience sort of the nightlife there and had a good time and got, and got paid for it. So that's like, definitely my favorite part of working with bigger companies who are not afraid to spend the money is the experience. And I think that's kind of, again, what got me into photography full time is the experience of working and being in places that I otherwise couldn't get into mm -hmm. like as a normal pedestrian. But now, like, I'm sitting in a room with, like, a celebrity, mm -hmm. and they're, like, we're, they're treating me as a professional. Mm -hmm. We're having a good time, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're in the room, you know you have access mm -hmm. to the snacks. Mm -hmm. And they're not just, like, oh, some stuff from the store. It's, like, no, we got caviar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it's the higher higher end. It's, it's, yeah. it's definitely the experience. That's what really um, drives me to curate or be a content creator or be a professional in, in the space. Um it's the quality of life. Like I enjoy the adventure of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, you never really know where you're gonna be, but when you get in, you're there. Like um, I also had a, not a similar experience, but I was able to. I got I got flown out to Jamaica um wow. to an all inclusive uh, resort and I, that I was able to stay there for seven days to document an event for someone. You know, mm -hmm. um, for free. So like mm -hmm. it was me plus my wife. So like mm -hmm. to be able to give her that experience uh through the work that I've done, mm -hmm. it's like it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know that that those are the doors that would be open when I first picked up a camera. But as I've kind of done what I've done, these are things that I've had access to. So mm -hmm. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. This is what makes me love what we do. And, yeah, yeah. That experience also got me. I guess uh, by technicality, the photo. I probably will, I might have it on screen, but um, mm -hmm. the photo is not anything special. It's just a group photo with some well-known people mm -hmm. um people i don't even know who they were but apparently they're well known and that was another thing like w because i i didn't grow up watching nba mm -hmm. i didn't know a lot of nba i didn't i didn't even know i mean it's like i probably seen them on tv mm -hmm. um kenny and charles barkley i also got to meet um but because i wasn't really familiar that much with i didn't constantly watch nba i didn't have a nervousness around them at all mm -hmm. i didn't i treated them like humans like yeah, i, I just, just didn't, didn't have sure. I didn't have this like nervousness, like, oh my God, like I didn't have that at all. Mm -hmm. Or like I what wasn't like, oh my God, I'm meeting him. Like I, I, I didn't have any of that. I just like talk to them like normal people because yeah. I didn't see them as anything. Uh, now, if I met Shaq, if I got to meet Shaq because I did see him, then it might be a different story because he's, he's everywhere. Yeah. Um, but um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, I took a group photo with some people like er very early before like the event really got started. And that photo ended up being on Entertainment Tonight Sweet. on the like page, and Sweet. my name was credited underneath. And I'm like, I'm published now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> I'm a published now. The price just went up. <laughs> that's what he said. That's what he said. No, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, but um, it, I mean, it didn't. I mean, like I said, it wasn't really. It was. It's more of a snapshot mm -hmm. uh, by technical terms, but it had <laughs> right time, right place. Like, like that's really what it took. It, like working for these DJs and that's like here in Greensboro got me to Cleveland and there's a lot of other, I and mean, there's a lot of other people I got to meet through that. And the social media manager also got to meet, got to go into some doors I couldn't go into. Mm -hmm. So she got to, she got to meet a lot of people. So sure. Um, it's just, it's just crazy. Like the, like just one thing leads to another. And that's why I say that like, especially if you haven't figured out your niche or you want to, or you, you maybe you want to try just other stuff. Maybe you have a niche and you just want to try other stuff too. Like that's why I haven't really picked a niche because I like the variety. Yeah. If I have a niche, it's, it, it is capturing passion, capturing personality, but it's like, I like that variety and the more niches you have, the more things you want to try, the more people you know, the more connections you have, the more work you'll probably get. Um, hopefully it's, it's just us like, Networking events, the more people you meet, like the more connections you have. And that's the more people that have you in their mind. I agree. That's the name of the game, man. Be 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 known, be memorable, um, be a point of reference for someone, do good work. And I think at the end of the day, that's just the business. Figure out your pricing, figure out your target audience, um, and work to 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 curate the best content for them. Um and that's that's been the name of the game for me. Um and I think um I think uh, to any young creatives who are trying to get in, definitely figure out what your market is, figure out who your market is, and then do your research, do your homework, find your way, find the best way to get in contact with those people and be present. Um, I don't know. Do you have any other, <laughs> anything else to add on top of that? 
because that's that I, I feel like that's the game i didn't know that for a while yeah. and um now i'm like that be uh, becoming a content creator is a thing it's like when i kind of got into photography it wasn't particularly a respected career path um 10 years later everyone's a content creator and everyone has these fancy cameras everyone can shoot ak 4k uh and it has become a career it's i don't okay here's a question that me and my uh, my good friend have do you think being a content creator garnishes respect like when you walk into a room full of lawyers doctors dentists and you say hey i'm a director um do you think the title has the same level of respect and i think it's i think it's ultimately how you frame it um and i this is a something i will not tell um, other people and um, and I won't I, I I wouldn't say this in the beginning of the podcast. Uh, so if you've gotten this through, then this is super valuable uh, to anyone who um, it works in more of a corporate setting, whether it be photography or video, or wants to get into that. If I'm at a networking event and someone walks up to me and asks what I do, uh, or I ask them what they do and they ask me that back, um, I won't say I'm a videographer. I won't say I'm a director. I won't, I won't, I won't even say I own a video production company. I will say, I, I will tell it like they they say, well, what do I do? I say, I help businesses get more customers and make more money through video and photo. Mm. It's all about how you frame it. I got you. It's like, I'm providing a service to these people. And I do that at network events because people go to network events, either they work for a company or they own a company. Um, and I mean, any, anyone who looks like a more business type, that's what I'll tell them. Uh, because then I sort of look like almost like an authority, like, oh my God, this guy can help me, like yeah. type of thing. Um, and it's like, and I, I mean, it's just more of a business sort of, like, it's like, what do you do as a videographer? What do you do as a photographer for these people? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a different way of looking at it, different way of framing it. I like that response because I feel like instead of putting a label on who you are, you become a problem solver. And that gives more room for interest. Um, I feel like someone will be more willing to ask you more about your services and how you can help them opposed to just, oh, he's a director, cool. And then moving on. Um, that was a great response. Um, yeah, that was a good response. Yeah, rather than, I mean, even, even when I just like cold message people, like which I'll, I'll do to some businesses I want to work with, like it's like I don't want to sell them on anything. I don't want to, I don't want to sell, like, I don't want to just for, be the first message with them, be like, hey, can I shoot a commercial for you? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, can I take a, take video of your, your next event? I mean, I probably just, I probably just start with, hey, how are you? Like, be just normal conversation. And then, and then, it, like, I mean, probably just, event, uh, if they see who I am, they could tell. But um, it's, it's kind of like just be a human being, like, get to know them first and then figure out like what maybe if they're a business owner then figure out what what like what they're struggling with right and then provide say oh oh since you need more customers i could make this type of video for you i could take these kind of photos for you i could take product whatever product photos whatever it is that they that you think that they could use to solve that problem for them i agree uh, being a problem solver is more valuable than just having a title or a label um and i i think um that's what gives you value and respect is if you can help someone. Um, I think as an entrepreneur, that should be the basis of your service in the first place. You're if, at the end of the day, a photographer, videographer, whatever you're a service provider, that service has to bring some level of value to the client or the community that you're, you know, targeting. And if you can't do that, then why should they hire you? Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's working with that mom who wants to document their child uh, or working with that lawyer who needs a professional headshot or working with the roofer who needs documentation or commercial for their roofing company. Um, at the end of the day, I've realized everyone needs our service. It's just about how you provide and solve that problem or communicate mm -hmm. to them this problem that can be solved through the work that you do. I mean, even, I mean, you could even look at that with like a, a wedding. Like it's yeah. like, it's like the bride, and the groom cannot, they cannot like hold their phone out the entire time no. and take film or take, right. take photo. 
<laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> they can't do that. You're so, you're providing a service. You're solving a problem for them. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, whether they whether they get someone to a friend of theirs just to use their phone the entire time, or they get a professional video team out there, or get a professional photographer out there, they're solving a problem. Yeah. Whatever that level of quality they want, they're solving a problem. Absolutely. So yeah. So what? This is sort of ending off everything what are your plans for podcasting oh for podcasting well um i don't know i enjoy the, the the this forum i enjoy the ability to talk with people i think similarly to why i enjoy photographing people um i enjoy talking to people i like hearing people's stories i feel like um when it comes to podcasting photography whatever the medium i like to connect with with people with people um so being able to sit here and hear your story, hear why you're passionate about what you do, hear what drives you, that inspires me. You know, I, I love that. I, I have a certain connecting feeling um, towards that. So going forward, if I were to continue doing the podcast, which is, you know, a goal for 2024, um, I would love to just have these natural conversations and really like figure out what moves people. I feel like um, we all have drive and you'd be surprised how connected most people are you know how similar like um our foundations are like myself you know i got into photography because my grandma took pictures you got into photography because your grandfather did you know um i, I i've i've realized um, as humans we're way more connected than we believe um you know as a inner as a kid who grew up in in the inner city of, of, of new york like the south bronx meeting you who've grown grown up here in north carolina at the I don't know your hometown, <laughs> but, yeah, right, sir. It's but grade, to see how we can connect and have like similar interests, you know, like I enjoy that portion of conversation. So going forward, if I were to continue um, doing, doing these podcasts, I would love to just continue to connect with people. What about yourself? I don't know if I could top all that, but <laughs> <laughs> I had a podcast before this. Uh, it definitely was very different. Uh, I mean, the idea was very similar, but the idea was a traveling podcast. It was yeah. like it's like I could travel anywhere and I could shoot I could like shoot interviews with anybody or shoot a podcast with anybody. And my whole thing was just like just telling like getting to know like just hear, hearing people out, like hearing the story, hearing where they came from, what their passions are. Very similar to how I feel about like the videos I do, getting that passion out there. Mm -hmm. Um I definitely want to can like this this idea that for a podcast is something I've had for a little bit, mm -hmm. and I think my network is a lot bigger than it was when I back when I did because I did podcast when I was doing YouTube, um, and I basically just did a couple podcasts with people, creative people that I went to school with, and it kind of it really relied on guests, and also I wanted I I really wanted it to be weekly, so like I really pushed and super like super hard to get get it weekly, and then once it wasn't weekly, it kind of like fell off, mm -hmm. which is why I don't want it to be weekly yeah, i don't yeah. want to do it on a normal basis maybe it's whenever it's whatever, whatever. yeah whenever i feel like i have extra time or feel like i can just say hey let's do it this afternoon like um i feel like i can do it and i feel like i have a much larger network of interesting people mm -hmm. that i can do it with and i'm going to try to get more than just content creators mm -hmm. business owners mm -hmm. uh any it really anybody i think that's just super interesting Hey man, mm -hmm. I agree. I feel like it's a platform, and we all, as human beings on this earth, <laughs> um, can connect or find a place, a way to connect. But the passions, we all have certain things that drive us. Um, and as entrepreneurs, we all have small businesses and different things that kind of uh, go into being an entre a business owner. So I feel like with a platform like that, there's so many avenues in which you can connect and promote, and give people a platform to not only speak or like humanize themselves right because most businesses you look at them as businesses you don't look at them as people who run those businesses i feel like i eat mcdonald's i don't eat mcdonald's i hate that <laughs> stuff but at the time in which i ate mcdonald's very frequently um i didn't it didn't register to me that someone incorporated and made the business it was just like oh let me just go buy these fries you know like there are people behind these things or like you know um, like the space that we hear uh, recording our podcasts, like there's the the owner of the space that which we both know, mm -hmm. who's a mutual good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. um, getting to know the person behind the space um, has been a big deal for me. And so, you know, I think these podcasts give those people the opportunity to um, be known, um, be known as the people who are behind the scenes, opposed to just the spaces and, and the businesses themselves. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I think I want to do this podcast whenever I feel like I can, and might be consistent, might not be, might be just when I feel like it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I feel like your audience is going to appreciate it, whether it's weekly or non-weekly. Mm-hmm. I feel like in the space that we kind of exist in today, we subscribe to the things that we like. Mm-hmm. So if if people enjoy this kind of content or this kind of forum, uh, they will tune in. So, mm-hmm. you know, I guess at the end of the day, like most of the work we do, as long as you do a good job, people will tune in and, um, you know, subscribe to you know the work that you do mm-hmm. you do great work thanks you, you do too <laughs> no no yeah i definitely looked through your catalog pretty recently and i was like really surprised at how much work you actually have done and um work is great i oh, appreciate that yeah man all right so i guess that's how we're gonna end it off um thank you guys for if you made it this far thank you for yeah. listening through and watching uh, this whole video um, once again my name is devon um and uh yeah Name's Dylan, and I'll see ya. Peace. <laughs> All right, cool beats. That was fun. How you feel? Okay. <laughs> You're gonna have to cut through those oohs and ums. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's gonna be an uncut, raw version. And then, like sometimes, like I, I, like I do derail, but I try to circle back. Like I do, I re- derail with the intent of coming back to connect to the point. <laughs> it wasn't recording. Huh? It wasn't recording. Are you serious? No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that? Oh man. I was terrified, guys. <laughs>